material of the context, and in this case, the AA student and staff body, and makes the work out of that. Tonight is going to talk not about international style, though we will have an opportunity to uh, perhaps refer to it and ask questions about it at the end. But tonight is going to talk about two different projects. So I'd like to introduce Nathan Curley. I asked to uh, have this mic on because when I'm nervous, I kind of pace up and down, so you'll have to follow me. <coughs> um, I think it's nice to always say why I do these things, why I, why I talk about my work publicly, and there are, mainly there are two reasons. One is that I am, of course, interested in what you think, because I have an ego. But, uh, and this is an opportunity for us to discuss the work. But if I was to be perfectly honest with you, I would say my main motivation for talking about my work is very selfish. I see this as an opportunity for me to learn something about what it is that I do. And I have found uh, that only through um, rather initially quite frightening situations like this, do you stop lying to yourself? So I kind of hope that maybe something of, the, of my kind of extended project will transfer into, into yourselves and you, know, you can think about how that relates to you. But I see tonight also as being uh, an opportunity to, for me to somehow not only find out what I've done, but possibly find a way of uh, continuing and traveling on somewhere else. So in that, in the spirit of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about just two projects that I've done. Uh, I, don't, I think I'm far too young to uh, go through 12 years of work. I think uh, that would be foolish. The two projects are both formally and uh, in terms of how they manifest themselves in the world, very different. But I would argue that they lie very closely side by side and in perhaps one is the antithesis of the other. In 1997 I was uh, commissioned by I was invited by the Stills Gallery in Edinburgh to, to work with them on the redevelopment of their gallery space. They had got lottery funding and they had decided that the space they were occupying was, as they said, insufficient for their needs. So as an artist, I was invited to do two things. One, to work with the architects and uh, to, to work with the design team uh, on the refurbishment of the gallery. Uh, this took the form of me working one day a week. And my job in that uh, part of the project was effectively to have two roles. One, to be the user, in a sense, to be the artist, to think about the space and the, the building in terms of how would, how would an artist deal with this, how would an, what are the artist's needs. And secondly, as a member of the public. So I wasn't the client that was still, and I wasn't the architect, I was a third person. At its best, that discussion was conceptual. There was, the, there was an issue of this, uh, this window, whether or not there should be a window in the gallery. Now for me, that was a conceptual question. Because you could argue that the, the artworks are the window to this other world or, or, or are the, the avenue into another way of thinking and so what does it mean for there to be a window out with the space where you're meant to contemplate the work so at its best these were the kinds of discussions at the at its worst it was what color is the tiles and the toilets going to be the second part of the invitation was to uh, create a public artwork which as they described would in some way be tied to the building project. 
and this is a phrase that I kept on coming back to in my, in my discussions with myself, that I was asked to make a public artwork which was tied to the building project. Now, one way of, one way of looking at that, at that could have been to, I don't know, make a, a mural in the cafe space or project light out of the front window onto the street in Edinburgh. Uh, I very early on decided not to do anything actually in the building because for two reasons. One, I felt we were spending an awful lot of money and an awful lot of time trying to make something very simple and very clean. And I was concerned that maybe if I created something which disturbed that, it would become a kind of stone around the neck of the, of the institution, both in terms of space and in terms of how they felt they could use it. So I didn't want to do that. I also became very uh, aware that the mechanism of, for argument's sake, changing this wall into a granite wall as opposed to a stud wall meant that, well, that would affect the engineering, which would, have, which would affect the foundations which were designed three months ago. So I felt as if the, op the opportunities to actually do something physically in the building were, were uh, conditioned by the, the mechanism of actually building uh, pieces of architecture. So I decided that the building wasn't going to be the location for this piece of public art. Now in one sense, I created a very obvious problem for myself because that meant I had no venue for the piece of public art, I had no sight. At the same time I became very fascinated by the mechanism that we as individuals went through in the building of this very public building. And the manner, very simply, it, it may seem obvious but for me it was quite startling, the manner in which we built this public space was totally private. We met every week and we didn't deal in three dimensions, we dealt in two dimensions. And it wasn't based on anything other than the individuals that were around the table. Now, of course, looking back on it, there's a reason why that's the case, because perhaps that's the most efficient way for buildings to be built. But for me, it was quite startling that it was almost a, a, a total contradiction to what we were trying to do. So I decided that uh, the manner in which I would locate my project and tie it to the building project would be to use the very system that we were using to, to rebuild the gallery. So what I proposed was that for my public artwork, we would make another building and that I would use exactly the same system as we were using to redevelop the Stills Gallery for my project. In a sense, I decided to turn the tables on the, the manner in which I was dealing with them and they were dealing with me. So instead of the artist being the consultant for the architect's project, I decided that they would be consultants for me. So the quantity surveyor would work with me, the architect would work with me, the client would work with me, the secretary would work for me. Now, as you can imagine, this wasn't treated with uh, open arms because uh, at that Christmas time, the gallery project was behind schedule, over budget. We'd gone through three project architects already and I was proposing to build another building. I proposed that this other building would be a sanctuary I proposed that it would be called an urban sanctuary and that we would site it somewhere in Edinburgh. <coughs> and in a sense, I used that term because in one way we could construe that the gallery was some form of space which uh, was special and out with the, the normal kind of, uh, the normal usage of space within the centre of Edinburgh. So very simply what I did was I, uh, I went about my task of researching how, how, I would, how would I build a sanctuary in Edinburgh? How would I fabricate a secular space? 
how would I make and locate a, an urban temple? How would you do that as an artist? So very, um, very studiously, I, I tried to find knowledge from other people. I, I went to Edinburgh University and I met with the Dean of Divinity and I said, my name is Nathan Coley, I've been commissioned to make a public artwork in Edinburgh and I've decided to build a secular space where you can find sanctuary. I want, you know, can you help me with this? He rather beautifully, and this is one of the, the most, uh, one of the best reasons for being an artist is that you meet these kind of people. Um, he rather beautifully didn't define what this space would be due to his religion or my religion. He spoke very generally about notions of uh, safe space and uh, what it would be to exist out with society. He also directed me to historical uh, spaces or institutions which might help me in my, in my research. This is an image of Holyrood Abbey, which historians discuss as being one of the oldest sanctuaries in Scotland. The Dean of Divinity, of course, said that don't be under any uh, illusions that this was necessarily a safe space. Because although you could escape from your debtors, all of the roughest people of society would end up here. And so uh, you found yourself maybe in another circumstance which wasn't necessarily um, one you would want to stay in for too long. He also gave me a, a piece of advice in terms of being careful. He said, you must understand if you make this space, you're creating a space where there's two types of law. Two types of law will, will govern this space that you make. He said, in normal space, there is common law, and this is the law that governs and rules that space. If you create a space of sanctuary, he argues, there's another law, a higher law, which he would describe as God's law. And I thought, that, this is fascinating. As an artist, I can create a space where there's two types of law simultaneously. So, of course, the next person I had to speak to was the Chief Superintendent of Lothian and Borders Police. So I met with this rather officious gentleman and I said, there's a man in Edinburgh University who's helping me with this project where I'm building a sanctuary here in Edinburgh. And he says, there will be two types of law which will govern this space. Common law and God's law. Can you help me with this? His initial reaction was, I've been a policeman for 30 years and I've never been asked a question like that before. And I must tell you that I know nothing about art. He then, over two hours, told me everything that he knew about art. Uh, and he, he was actually very open. He said that this was an interesting question for him because he said the important thing that you must recognize is that the police force imply law on the land and this was the key phrase that he used, with the consent of the community. So there are, there are rules and obligations which people have to apply, have to adhere to. But the police enforce them with the consent of the community. An example he gave was that people can, can uh, seek political asylum and run into the church, literally run into the church, and the police are in their rights to break down the door and drag you screaming out of, the, out of the, this sacred religious space. They're within their rights legally to do that. However, they don't. And it's not because of law that they don't, it's because of that they have to act with the consent of the community. And if they feel that they won't have the consent, they won't do that. I also met with the architect of the, of the gallery. I was interested in trying to find out from him what is the difference between my position as an artist making this space and the position that you would take as an architect making this space. What do you do as an architect? What do you think you do as an architect? 
what do I do as an artist? What do I think I do as an artist? Neil Gillespie from Reagan Hall was very clear, I thought, in terms of what his function was. He said, for him, the role of the architect was no longer to change the world. He argued that his role as an architect was to make things a little bit better. He felt that uh, his role was to make, when you went swimming, that you swam, it was more enjoyable. Or that if you went shopping, it was safer. Or that if you stayed in a hotel, it was possibly a nicer hotel than it would have been prior to him being the architect building it. And he clearly felt that the role, as far as he was concerned, the role of the artist was completely different from that. It wasn't necessarily to make things better. I met with a Feng Shui consultant. And interestingly, he was the only person that I paid. And people subsequently have said, you had a really strange conversation with that guy. So I asked him, uh, he's the guy with the ponytail, by the way, just in case you're wondering. I asked him, where should this urban sanctuary be in Edinburgh? What's the best place, according to your philosophy? What's the best place in Edinburgh? And what should it look like? He couldn't tell me what the best place could be, but he was very clear about the worst place. As far as Feng Shui is concerned, the worst place for a building is at the, the, the opposite side of a T-junction. So if this is the road and this is a road here, if you have a house here, as far as Feng Shui is concerned, this is the worst place. He argues that the, the Xi, the energy, travels down this road and comes to here and doesn't know where to go. So this house has a bad energy to it. So he said, this would be the worst place. I said, well, what, what's this, what should this building, what shape should this building take? And he said, well, he felt that the best shape on the outside should be a square. That a square was a strong shape to deflect negative energy. But he felt it was very important that the inside shape was a circle because he argued that if the interior had corners all of the good energy would get lost in the corners and wouldn't be able to get out again. He then subsequently assessed my house, which was rather cheeky of him, and uh, said we had to move the bathroom into the other side and put a mirror in front of the oven. And, uh, <laughs> and I think we did have a very particular type of conversation because I'm sure I wanted my money's worth out of him. And and the reverse of that, he wanted to give me what I wanted because he was getting paid. A friend in Edinburgh said, there's a guy in London you should meet for this project. And he works at the AA. He said, you must go and meet this guy, Mark Cousins. <laughs> I don't know if Mark is still here. I spoke to him earlier on and I said I was going to name drop him. So. And I changed my flight, I was flying in from somewhere, and I changed my flight specially to, to come and meet him. And it was a Friday afternoon, and I'm convinced he forgot I was coming. And I went to reception, and I said, I've got an appointment to meet Mark Cousins. And he was, but to his credit, he gave me, you know, half an hour, bought me a drink. And I said, I'm building this, this space in Edinburgh, and I, someone gave me advice to say that you would be ideal to advise me on it. Now, those of you who know Mark know that this conversation could have gone in any direction. He straight away said, well, we must deal with the issue of ugliness. <laughs> I thought to myself, I'm building an urban sanctuary in Edinburgh and you're talking to me about ugliness. But he rather interestingly referred to uh, the, the contents of... Um, Notre Dame de Paris and said you must deal with this in terms of escaping society and the issue of ugliness and um, the individual within the city. He also spoke uh, rather lucidly about Victor Hugo's notion about the death of architecture. 
Victor Hugo argues that there's a point in history where architecture is dead. And that point of history is the point at the, where the invention of the printing press happened. Victor Hugo argues that up until that point, the values and beliefs of society existed and manifested itself in built form. And that was the way in which society's ideas traveled and retained any kind of symbolism. He said at the moment where architecture, uh, where ideas were written down, at the moment where architecture was, uh, ideas were written down, that was the death of architecture. Ideas traveled through literature and through publications. I also met with my, my uh, very good friend, Christine Boland, who's another artist. I wanted to meet with Christine because I wanted to talk to her about audience. I wanted to, to have a conversation about well, who would the audience be for this space? How would they know about it? How would they find out about it? How would they use it? And who would have uh, ownership of it? Would the audience own it? Would I have to negate my uh, authorship? Also, subsequently, people have said that the conversation that I have with Christine is very different from the rest of them because we seem to speak in a language which is very personal to, to us. I think that's, there's two reasons for that, I think. We know each other very well and I guess we're both artists and so there are, there are areas and issues which we don't have to go into in great depth. She spoke about the idea of, um, for her, what sanctuary meant for her. She said, for me, sanctuary would be to have more time Rather than to have a space, she said, I want more time on my own. So how, do you, how, how, do, how would I create a space where you can have more time? She also said, well, what would happen, though, if it became really popular and everybody went? You know, like your, your favourite holiday destination, that everyone finds out that it's fantastic and then it's absolutely ruined. So... It became obvious to me that the last thing I should do through all this research was to actually build a sanctuary. Because my notion of what sanctuary was and what I could make in Edinburgh is totally my idea of it. And increasingly everybody that I met came up with their own personal interpretation of what the words were and what that meant to them. Some people said, well, sanctuary for me would be walking in the hills. Other people felt, well, my sanctuary would be the Oxford Bar which I thought was quite interesting, you know, lots of people and alcohol. So it was absolutely um, futile, I felt, to actually build it. So very simply what I did, in the spirit of Victor Hugo's notion of the death of architecture, I decided to print, to publish all of the interviews, all of the research, all of the investigation into what this building would look like. I would never describe the publication as being anything other than a public artwork. It's not a catalogue, it's not an artist book, it's not a documentation of an event. It's a public artwork which manifests itself as a publication. It has this kind of design issue going through it which is quite like a kind of reference book, it's quite like the Yellow Pages. It, it seems to want to be used and referred to rather than actually kept safe. I went through really um, moments of uh, real change in terms of what it actually was because my voice is on every page. Because I'm asking the questions. And I thought, this is a self-portrait. This is about me. It's not about anybody else. And then I also went through a sense of thinking that it was about all these other people that I interviewed. But I think uh, it's that, and it's also um, almost a portrait of the person who reads it. The space within it for you to find your own sanctuary. It's a, it's a, it's a classic uh, contradiction in terms. It's meant to be a public space. It's meant to allude to the notions of 
who you are within a collective group. But the manner in which you deal with it is a very private one. There's actually space towards the end. This is the back cover. There's actually space towards the end of it where there's blank pages. And the design idea was that by that time you would have your own ideas of what sanctuary would be and you would uh, fill in your own ideas and, uh, I don't know, maybe make your own. Thanks. <coughs> so I'm commissioned to make this public artwork. I go about my research and I decide that the manifestation of it is going to be a publication. How does it exist in the world is the, the most important question, I think, after, after it's been made. How does it relate to an audience or its audience? And more importantly, I think, how does its audience relate to it? So, Urban Sanctuary, the public artwork, exists in the world in, very, in three ways. One is that we very carefully and studiously created an audience for it. And the manner in which we did that was very simply we sent copies out to people who had either been involved in it or that we felt would be interested in the, in the discussion or that we felt someone might need sanctuary. And if you think of it in terms of, uh, think of it clearly in terms of working as a public artwork and its relationship to its audience, I think sending them out and creating an audience has a high dynamic, but quite a short lifespan. So it's high dynamic and a short lifespan. The second way that we, that it exists in the world is that we very carefully placed a copy in every library and reference center in Edinburgh. 310, I think, something like that. Now again, think of it as a public artwork in terms of its relationship to its audience. That has a very, 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 very low dynamic, but lasts forever. Unless they sell the books or close the libraries. So you, maybe no one sees it for, maybe no one references it for five years, but then someone does. So that's the second way it exists in the world. The third way is that, uh, again, using a, the, the structure and the mechanism of making buildings, is that we, uh, I stole a planning notice in Edinburgh. And these, these are the public announcements you have to make to gain permission to, or not to gain permission, to notify the public that permission has, is being sought to demolish or build or change uh, buildings. So I, we, I, I stole one and we, we changed the words of it slightly. And I installed 30 of these public notices throughout Edinburgh, both in the, you know, in Leith Walk and in the Royal Mile and in the New Town and in, you know, good areas and bad areas. And the notice would read, uh, planning permission has been sought to build an urban sanctuary in Bedford Square for the purpose of giving sanctuary to people. And instead of the contact address being Edinburgh City Planning Department, it was the managers of the public art project. And the telephonist was briefed that if anyone phoned up asking, what the hell is this public notice outside my flat? Uh, that she would say, well, I'll send you more information about it. And what they get sent was the publication. Now, interestingly, we got lots and lots of uh, letters and telephone conversations from people demanding to know what the hell is this sanctuary that's getting built next to you? And that uh, we're part of a housing association and you can't possibly build this unless you've spoken to us and there's been consultation. Legal lawyers' letters. Uh, so that's one extreme. The other side was uh, elder ladies phoning up asking, which one of the buildings is it that's going to be demolished for the birds? <laughs> which I thought was beautiful. It's like the, the demolition of something to create sanctuary rather than the addition of something. 
nobody replied after, nobody looked for more information after they were sent the publication, apart from one person, the chief superintendent of the police. He wrote back in a very particular kind of Latin English style that uh, he was delighted to have received it and looked forward to actually viewing the building when it was complete. Now, for me, an interesting thing happened. Let me just turn that off. These are some of the other signs. Now, for me, an interesting thing happens with that work in terms of its life uh, lifespan. It's still going. It's still current. It still has an audience. It still exists. Uh, it was reviewed in Blueprint. So the architecture world dealt with it as an architectural project. It won a, an international typography award for the way in which it was set out. So it, I'm, I'm trying to build a public artwork and, I, and it ends up being in, a, in a, a typography world. And rather bizarrely, I recently was asked to somehow present it in Stockholm through the Moderna Museum. And I said I was really uncomfortable about it existing in a museum, but what we should do is place it in all of the libraries of the city. And one of the libraries is the Nobel Academy Library. Um, and they wrote back to us, the secretary wrote back to us and said, not only are we going to put it in the library, but the academy are going to assess it under literature. And I said, listen, I'm a guy from Glasgow trying to make art, doing, you know, doing the stuff that I'm interested in doing. What do you mean that the Nobel Prize literature assessors are going to be viewing my, uh, my publication? I haven't heard if I've got through to the second <laughs> round. <laughs> I don't, somehow I don't think so. But you know, if I was sitting in Glasgow trying to be a writer and thought, God, you know, best thing in the world would be for it to be assessed by the Nobel Academy. You know, of course, that's, that's not the route it would take. I, I really need to learn, uh, learn from that and, I don't know, try and be a professional golfer and I'll end up, uh, you know, selling paintings or something. You know. So, this summer, uh, I was invited by the Icon Gallery in Birmingham to put forward a proposal uh, for a project they were organising called As It Is. And basically the theme or the, the kind of remit was to deal with the city of Birmingham, not in a romantic way or in a, a kind of superficial way, but to deal with it as it is. It's a kind of hard brief, I think. And through a number of, uh, through a number of visits, I became interested in the fact that Birmingham City Council, the city of Birmingham, acknowledges 16 different languages. So if you're looking for information on childcare, you can find it printed in 16 different languages. I thought this was fascinating. And I thought, that is such an indication of what the city is, it's such an indication of Birmingham as it is. Incidentally, this is not Birmingham as it is. This is 1973, I think. At the same time, I was reading uh, some books by uh, Ruskin, 19th century English artist and writer. Kind of dubious character, but some quite kind of interesting ideas. One of his books that he wrote uh, called The... <coughs> The Seven Lamps of Architecture. I mean, to paraphrase, to paraphrase the whole book, it's basically it deals with the notion that architecture exists in sight of God or in sight of a God. One of the, one of the chapters uh, within the book is called The Lamp of Sacrifice. And in that chapter, Ruskin 
tries to deal with the notion of how architecture can have meaning and value. And this is how he defines the difference between building and architecture. Architecture has meaning and value and building doesn't. Now in this chapter he argues that one of the ways in which architecture has value is through the sacrifice which has been undertaken in the building of it. Now he illustrates that in two ways. One is financial sacrifice, that collectively as a community we gather our money together and we build a hospital for the children. So the building as far as Ruskin is concerned has value <coughs> and meaning due to the sacrifice that the community have uh, in terms of money. The other example he gives is the sacrifice of labour and he illustrates that by discussing the role that slave families, three, three generations of slave families had in the building of the pyramids. The pyramids have meaning as far as he's concerned due to the sacrifice of these people. So for this project in Birmingham, I decided that I would turn this notion of sacrifice around. And I decided that I would place myself in a position of sacrifice and try and make a work from that position. And in the light of, uh, could you focus on this a little bit? In the light of uh, the fact that there were 16 official languages, I somehow wanted to try and use or try to illustrate the different communities that spoke these 16 different languages in Birmingham. So very simply what I did was I, I, I used existing reference material, and in this case, the pages of the, the yellow pages of central Birmingham. And what I did was I, I found the list of places of worship. And to the gallery, what I did was I proposed that I would remake I would remake every place of worship in central Birmingham in the gallery space over the period of the show. I would remake pieces of architecture which in themselves you could construe have had a degree of sacrifice in their making. So I set up my studio, my working space in the gallery and set about remaking all 161 places of worship in Birmingham. This is probably after five days. I made about four, between four and five a day. And what I did was I, I mean, absolutely absurd. I spent two months in the gallery and I had two assistants. So I didn't actually see anything of Birmingham. I stayed in the gallery. I kind of had this life between where I was living, the gallery, and some of the places around where the gallery was. I had two assistants who had the list. And they were from Birmingham, and they traveled around Birmingham taking digital images of each building. So I would come in in the morning. The images would be downloaded. I would access through the computer the images, and I would work from the images and spatially remake them out of cardboard. As each one was made, the number would be put on the, the yellow pages list and a pin would be placed in the map to signify where, where each place of worship was. So, number 19. So that signifies, that's the 19th place that I remade. Now, for me, was, the cardboard was an interesting material to use. It, it in itself has no value, but everybody is very familiar with. So, in terms of the material's relationship to the audience, it was really simple. It's cardboard. After about three days, I became really good at it. And it became really boring. There was, you know, I, I actually, I became, I quite surprised myself how spatially aware I was. At first I would draw them and then make them, <coughs> but then gradually I could just look at the, the images on the computer and I would spatially know how that was constructed. 
what scale it would be. They're all the same scale. They're all kind of 1 to 35, roughly. Now, once, in one sense, the project is sculpture. Of course it is. It, it occupies space. It manifests itself in terms of form. So the pro part of the project is definitely sculptural. My presence in the gallery, I would, argue mean, I would argue that that means that part of the project is performance, that I am there, I am making the sculptures. But increasingly I became interested in the fact that perhaps the project was neither of these two things, or maybe more precisely that the project was somewhere in the middle of these two things. There was neither performance and neither sculpture. Essentially, I would, the proposition was, what does it mean for the artist to be in the gallery remaking every place of worship of your town? What does that mean? And what, how, how do you deal with that? So that area between where I was, where I was working, and these objects, I argued that's where the work was. Now, interestingly, that is the same space where the audience were as well physically and conceptually, I think. So again, this is maybe day five or something like that. I kind of I like to, I like this image, because I kind of think of like other artists like Joseph Boyce and his kind of performances and how the, the production objects become valuable themselves. So I asked the icon not to throw out the table, but I'm not sure what they've done with it. It's kind of residue of activity, which in itself, I actually think it's quite aesthetic, but uh, perhaps really doesn't have any value. So this is the last day. This is uh, seven weeks later. Now, for me, an interesting thing happened halfway through. Up to a point, you would enter the space, there would be space on the floor, there would be this artist working away and making these, what, what are these things he's making? Oh, they're places of worship. He's remaking the city that I live in, that I can recognize. So people would come in and there would be initially a moment of recognition. They would say, I know what this is. I recognize what this is. And then, of course, they would, their second thought, I could see it in their faces, their second thought was, but well, this is not what it is. This is something else. And what people would do is, they would look to see buildings that they knew or they could recognize. They would look to them as landmarks. And they would look to associate where this church was in relationship to what this is. Now, if they recognized this church, they wanted to know, well, that building isn't beside that church, though. So in a sense, I was remapping the city of Birmingham, not in any other way other than where, where these places of, uh, where these people who spoke all these different languages perhaps could have, meet, could have met. Then my primary interest in the places, not my primary, one of my interests in these buildings was that they were very simply places where people meet. The buildings where people, where you can identify groups of people. And that what would it mean to remake all of these places and put them together in a manner in which they could never exist in real life? And so the synagogue in my world maybe sits right beside the Buddhist temple. And the Russian Orthodox Church maybe sits right beside the Anglican Cathedral. And the Sikh temple sits right beside, <coughs> you know, the... Methodist preaching house, which of course in real life would never happen, but in my world, you know, they were kind of sandwiched together. But halfway through, a really interesting thing happened. Up until the point where it was halfway through, there was, it was all about the potential of this world being made. It was all about the artist attempting to remake all of the places of worship in Birmingham. And you as the audience would come in and it would about, be about your imagination filling the space. 
But it was after a crucial point, it became, still became that. It became an issue of, well, will he finish it? But halfway through, it became a question of, well, what are these objects? And of course, the objects were a residue of the previous five weeks. So what did they signify in relation to the artist standing over there making another one? And for me personally, up until about halfway, I kind of I have this image in my mind of me kind of pushing this big rock up a hill. And when I got to halfway, I got the rock over the hill, only to find that I was tied to the bloody thing. But up to a point, I was, I was giving the project momentum. I was coming in every day and working. And if I didn't get four done, if I only get three done, I had to come in the next day and make five, so I wasn't behind schedule. If I didn't, if I only made four, that meant I still had to make five the second day. And it, it still lives me that there's a real feeling of, God, this project is in control of me now, and, and I just need to kind of stay with it. I, I'm not in any way uh, directing which way it's going. <coughs> Buildings, of course became symbols of the buildings. They became signifiers of these places of worship. And they also became signifiers of my sacrifice, my time. And gradually uh, hated the audience. <coughs> making, the, making the models, remaking the buildings themselves was quite difficult. And <coughs> actually I kind of pitched it just right. It was enough of a sacrifice that it, that it actually felt, you know, uh, it felt like a kind of tough project, but I kind of managed to do it. But spending every day in the gallery remaking them and talking to the public was insane. And the reason that it was insane and became really difficult was that 